stress, fear, depression, spiritual warfare. Are you weighted down? Do you need refreshing? Welcome, welcome everyone to the Warriors for Christ podcast, where we seek to uplift, edify, and encourage you to be light and salt in a dark and tasteless world with your host, Kyle. Well, good morning, and welcome to Warriors for Christ podcast. Uh, I am Sam. Kyle is not with me this week. Uh, our schedules don't line up, so I'm actually doing this recording over the phone. But uh, today, we're going to talk about believe, and, and really, what does it mean to believe? And we're going to look at different passages in Scripture. Uh, a lot of people will use the term belief, but don't understand that the Bible uses the term believe, but Sometimes uh, the belief results in a salvation, other times it, it does not. And so we're going to actually look at Scripture and what Scripture says about the topic. Uh, so why don't we open up in prayer. Father, I thank you. For everyone that's listening today, oh God, I pray that your Spirit will open eyes and open ears. And Father, that you will give understanding. Father, that we will understand and know what it means to believe, to have a belief that results in salvation. Father, I'm excited as we go through your word. Your word is so full of truth. It brings life and healing to our bodies, and it results in being filled with all the fullness of God, being born again. Father, bless the time that we have. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so for belief, starting off, uh, I have a, a list of passages that I wrote down just from, I was going through doing a lot of reading this past week, and I want to start in the book of Mark. So in Mark chapter 1, looking there first, uh, looking at verse 15, looking at what Jesus spoke. So Jesus, in Mark chapter 1, uh, verse 15, uh, Jesus came, well, in verse 14, he came into Galilee and he was preaching the gospel of God. And he was saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. And believe in the gospel. Now, when you look at the gospel and you say, well, what really is the gospel? In Mark chapter 1, verse 1, it says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and it goes on, starts talking about all the life chronicles and everything. It's simply good news. Good news of what? Well, to read the Bible, you got to read the whole book, the entire gospel of Mark, or John, or Matthew, or Luke, and read the entire book to actually understand what it's saying. As you continue to look down in verse 17, Jesus, after he saw Simon and Andrew, he says, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. So when you look at this, and you look at what it means to believe here, one, he says, well, there's a, first you have to repent. There's a repent and a believe. Uh, so keep that in mind. As we keep looking at Scripture, you're going to see additional things that continue to come out of it. The problem is sometimes if people only read a part or they don't read all of it, um, they get to fill in uh, the voids with what they think it means to believe, but not really truly understanding what, what the Scripture teaches. Now, when you flip to the back of Mark chapter 16, and he talks again about believe, after you've gone through the whole book, it's interesting to note what is recorded. So in the back... Uh, Jesus says, in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, he says, speaking to the disciples, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. So now we have an instruction. Not only do you have to believe, and we still haven't spoken about, well, what do we mean by believe? Uh, believe in what? Uh, and we'll get to other aspects of those later on. But you also have to be baptized. Well, what baptism is it talking about? Water baptism? Spiritual baptism? Those are good questions. As you continue to look, it says in verse 17, these signs will accompany those who have believed. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will pick up serpents. If they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. 
They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Now, when you look at those passages, uh, we know that, that, that those are, when you look at those, those are different gifts of the Spirit. You have different aspects and protections of the Spirit of God when someone who has the Spirit of God living in them, the same fullness of deity that Christ had that we've covered in other episodes. Now, as you look at this, does that mean every single person will cast out a demon? That every single person will speak in a tongue? That every person will do healing? Well, we did an episode on tongues, and uh, that we looked at that in 1 Corinthians, I think chapter 14, a lot of the passages. And when you actually go and you look and study that, I think actually starting in chapter 11 uh, through 14, and it talks that uh, it's, it's God who determines who gets what, which gifts. And it specifically says not everybody will speak in tongues. Not everybody will do healings. Not everybody will be a prophet. Not everybody will be an apostle. Uh, but God chooses and gig, gives gifts as, as he chooses according to the Spirit. So this doesn't mean that every person will do all those, but there will be a sign. You will have a spiritual gifting. That's one of the proofs or the evidence of having a belief that results in salvation or being spiritually baptized or born again. And there's other passages in the Bible that talks about what that means. So it's important that we look at Scripture to define what those things are and what the results of the proof is. And we don't come up with our own idea just because, oh, well, I, have, I know I have a sincere desire. Well, I have a desire to serve God. I confess Jesus as my Lord. Okay, but there's places in the Bible that says people confess and it doesn't result in salvation. But they'll be cast into hell. So how do we know? And that's why we're going through and looking at these different aspects in these different passages. Now, referring to belief, uh, next time I want to look at Luke, and then we're going to get to the book of John. In the book of Luke, chapter 8, it talks about the parable of the seed, the seed that's sown. There are four different seeds, one beside the road, one on rocky soil, uh, one on soil, but they had weeds and thorns, and one on good soil. So in chapter 8, looking at verse uh, 11, where Jesus actually goes through and starts to explain the parable. In chapter 8, verse 11, he says, the parable, is this, uh, uh, or the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Those beside the road are those who have heard. Then the devil comes, he takes away the word from their heart so that they will not believe and be saved. So in this case, it says they never believed, they will not be saved. And he takes it, he steals it from their heart. You see, the seed is implanted in the heart. And this is key. This comes up a lot. Uh, we talked about, we did two episodes on God requires a new heart, part one and part two, looking at Old Testament, New Testament passages. If you haven't covered those, I encourage you to go look at those. But then he talks about in verse 13, uh, the next one, the seed, the second seed. Those that fell on the rocky soil are those who, when they hear, they receive the word with joy. They're excited. They have joy. and but it goes on to say, these have no root. They don't have root. They believe for a while, and in time of temptation or persecution, they fall away. Now, in this case, the second seed, it says they received it with joy. They're excited. It says they believe, but their belief is only a temporary belief. And in the end, during temptations, they don't overcome. They fall away. So just because you believe, it's like, well, obviously they believe, but it doesn't seem like uh, they had power. Uh, maybe they believe, but they weren't spiritually born again or baptized in the Spirit. As you look at the third seed, verse 14, the seed which fell among the thorns, these are the ones who have heard, and when they go on their way, they are choked out with worries and riches and pleasures of this life, and they become unfruitful. Now, and this one, I think as you look at all the different stories of the different Gospels as this comes together, they also received it with joy. They believed, but they didn't persevere. They didn't bring any fruit to maturity or perfection. They were choked off. They didn't endure. They stopped, be, they, they stopped bearing fruit. Now, you can only bear spiritual fruit if you have the Holy Spirit, but you can quench the Spirit. The Bible talks about people who don't endure to the end. Jesus warned the churches. Some of them were going to get cut off. They weren't going to overcome. Uh, and that was in the book of Revelation. We did that on what church are you in that episode. 
Now in verse 15, it says, But the seed and the good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart. They hold it fast. See, they endure. They hold it fast. They bear fruit with perseverance. So obviously in that one, um, you know, that was a belief that's going to result in salvation in the end. Now, flipping over to John, let's look at what John says. Now, many people know John 3.16. I'm sure many of those listening probably can recall John 3.16. But the question is, do you understand the context and all the words of John 3.16? Well, it all starts in chapter 1. You see, in chapter 1, after it talks about how Christ came into the world, it says in verse 11, chapter 1, verse 11 of John, He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. His own countrymen, the Jews, many of them rejected him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. But it doesn't stop there. It says, who were born... Not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Born of God. And it goes on talking about what does it mean to be born of God. Speaking of Christ, it says, The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glories of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, as you keep reading in verse 16, it says, For of his fullness, the same fullness Christ had, we have all received, Grace upon grace. Well, being born of God, being filled with all the fullness of God, it's spiritual baptism or spiritual birth. He didn't say just believe, but you have to believe and be born of the Spirit of God. Well, when you start looking all these things together, what does it mean to repent? You know, in the Gospels, it says you have to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. If you don't keep with repentance, the axe is laid at the root of the tree, ready to cut it down and be cast into hell. So repentance, it seems like it's more than just a change of mind. It's, is it a change of a way of life? Is it a change of practice? Does sin still dwell within us? What does it mean to be spiritually born again? Now, there's many other passages that talk about that, that explain what does it mean to be crucified with Christ or spiritually baptized with Christ. We don't need to speculate. We don't need to assume. We can go to the Word of God and let the Word of God tell us what those things mean. Now, in the case, continuing looking at belief here, and John, uh, moving on to John chapter 3, it's important that when you go through, as Jesus was telling Nicodemus, he said, when Nicodemus came to him, Jesus said in John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus answered and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So it's not just believe, there has to be being born again. Well, Nicodemus didn't understand. He said, How can a man be born again when he is old? He cannot enter into the womb a second time, can he, and be born? Jesus answered in verse 5, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. You see, that which is born of flesh is flesh. You have the natural birth. We all know you have the natural birth of a baby, born of water and blood. But that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And verse 6, Do not be amazed that I said that you must be born again. You see, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from, and you do not know where it's going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. So Nicodemus didn't understand this. Now, as you keep reading in John chapter 3, that's where you get to John 3, 16. As it says in verse 15, So that whoever believing might in him have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever is believing in him might not perish, but might have eternal life. King James Version will say, should not perish but should have eternal life. It's not a shall, it's a should, it's a subjective verb. Well, why is it subjective? Why is it conditional? Why isn't it absolute? Well, is it a belief? Is it a repentance and belief? Is it a belief that was actually being born of the Spirit of God? Well, what does the Spirit of God do? Well, the Spirit of God does something. It gives us a new heart. And we talked about uh, the heart. Before we get a new heart, our old heart is desperately wicked. Sin dwells in our heart. It's the wicked thoughts, the evil thoughts that defile us. So how do we get rid of that heart? You have to get a circumcised heart, circumcised by the Spirit of God. The appeal to God for the good conscience is what Peter calls baptism. 
receiving that new or that good conscience, the good heart. Well, what's the result of a good heart? Well, as you keep looking here, and John, as you keep reading, he says in uh, verse 19, it's still in John chapter 3, this is, ju- this is the judgment, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, for their deeds were evil. Now, if you go to most people in a church and you say, hey, do you, do you love darkness? Do you love darkness or do you love light? I'd be willing to bet that most of all the people there, if you pull them and ask the question, they're going to say, well, of course I love the light. I don't love darkness. I love the light. But there's a response of man, and then there's the eyes and the ways and the thoughts of God and what God sees. You see, when God looks at someone and he continues to see evil deeds, then in the eyes of God, you don't love light. As a matter of fact, you hate the light. You see, this is the same concept that was discussed in 1 John. Most people know 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, 9, and 10. They can quote them. They, they know about if you confess your sins, and they say, see, I have to continue to confess my sins every night. They know about if you say you have no sin, then you deceive yourself and the truth is not in you. But who is that speaking to? Would people agree that if you said, is that speaking to Christ? They say, of course it's not speaking to Christ. He didn't sin. He didn't have sin dwelling in him. I would agree. But what about somebody who's been born again, where it says all sin has been removed from their life? The wicked heart to which sin dwells has been removed. They've been given a new perfect heart. They've been placed in perfect holy sanctification, pure light with no darkness, pure unleavened bread with not a speck of leaven. Well, when, would that person continue to say that they have sin dwelling in them? You see, if you look closer at 1 John chapter 1, he's speaking to those who don't have fellowship. In verse 3, he says, I'm writing these things to you so that you, you too might have fellowship with us. Indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son. He goes on in verse 5 and tells them that this is the message we heard from him and announced to you. What's this gospel message? That God is light and him there is no darkness at all. He says, if, if, you, if we say we have fellowship with God, because he was speaking to a church, he already said they don't. He wants them to, at least his first group he's talking to. He says, and you still walk in darkness, then you lie and you do not practice the truth. But they say they have fellowship with God. God says, you're a liar. You do not practice the truth. And verse 7, it says, if you walk in the light, as God himself is in the light, remember, God has no darkness. If you have the Spirit of God dwelling in you, the Spirit of God only produces one fruit, good fruit. It doesn't produce works of the devil. It produces works of God. So you have to examine yourself. It goes on. It says um, in chapter 2, when it actually shifts over and talks to those who are the little children who have been born again, in verse 3, it says, by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says, oh, I've come to know him, I've come to know Christ, does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So again, man will say, oh no, I, 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 I am in the light. Man will say, oh no, I do have fellowship with God. Man will say, oh no, you don't understand, I do have fellowship with Christ. I confess him as my Lord. And yet they aren't aware of all these passages where God says, no, you're a liar, the truth is not in you. No, depart from me, I don't know you, you continued with sin in your life. And so I ask, how are you evaluating? Based upon how you were taught? You, the, the logic and the wisdom of man, uh, some pastor or teacher? Well, the Bible warns over and over, beware of the many false prophets who come in, in as, as a uh, wolf, but in sheep's clothing. It says you're going to know them by their fruit, but initially they're going to be as a hidden reef. You aren't going to notice them. We'll look at some of those passages later on as we keep going. So here in John chapter 3, back to the Gospel of John, the book of John chapter 3, verse 19 if you still have darkness, or you still have deeds of evil, then God says, you don't love the light, you love darkness. You see, in verse 20, it says, everyone who does evil hates the light. You can say, no, no, but I, but I love the light. Do you do evil? Do you struggle? Do you have to confess your sins every night because it still dwells and lives in your heart? Remember, sin is the thought. We covered that with a new heart. What defiles a man is the thought. You have the anger of man, you're guilty of murder. Lust for a woman, guilty of adultery. It's a thought. And it's all in the heart. You have to get a new heart. That's the spiritual baptism part. You see, if you believe, but you aren't spiritually baptized, what does it profit you? And we're going to look at examples in the Bible of many people who believe, but were never spiritually baptized. And the question is, well, what were you baptized into? What did you believe? We're going to look at those passages. So as we continue in John chapter 3, After verse 19, verse 20 says, again, everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come into the light 
so that their deeds will not be reproved. There's some people who just still won't admit that they're a wicked person. Now, some will. Some will say, oh, there's none righteous. No, not one. And they'll quote Romans chapter 3, verse 10, verse 11. There's no one who understands, no one who does good, no one who seeks God. Well, well, then by their own mouth, they confess that they're still the man in darkness. They confess that they're still the man who's condemned, who has not been converted and changed, has not received the grace of God, the gift of righteousness, the Holy Spirit, that produces only one kind of fruit, righteousness. You see, that passage in Romans chapter 3, and we covered it in the episode of Romans chapter 3, is speaking to all the fools born into the world that don't inherit the kingdom of heaven. They're all the fools that are in darkness. Contrast versus the righteous man who does no evil, who does no evil, who doesn't speak deceit. These are quotes taken from Psalm chapter 14 and Psalm chapter 15. We covered these things. Listen to the word of God. Let the word of God instruct you. Don't let man deceive. Let God correct. God's word is true, holy, and consistent. It doesn't contradict itself. It explains the context. In verse 21, But he who practices the truth comes to the light, so that his deeds may be manifested as having been worked in God. Now, as you keep going, the rest of chapter 3 at the very end, in verse 36, it says so, He who is believing in the Son is having eternal life. But who does not, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life but the wrath of God abides on him. Now you have an aspect of obedience. But I assure you, it's not talking about man's attempt or works of the law to bring about obedience. It's talking about the work of the Holy Spirit, whether or not you receive the grace of God. And we'll do an episode after this one on what is really the true grace of God. And we'll look at the passages that talk and define what grace is, what it does, what the results are of what God's Word says. And you'll be surprised. There's many, many passages that, that you haven't heard. Now, some of you guys have probably heard the passage in Titus where it defines what the grace of God is in chapter 2, verse 11, that many people don't know, but for those that have listened, you've heard me quote that. But there's other passages that talk about the grace of God that people are not aware of and are not being taught in the church because they're being fed by people who don't understand. Now, let's go over to John chapter 6. We're going to look at some of the disciples who believed. But you know what? They didn't continue. In John chapter 6, around verse 36... Uh, if I remember correctly. Uh, Yep. So Jesus is speaking to uh, a bunch of the people and also his disciples with him. And Jesus makes some statements that's hard to understand regarding uh, his body. And he says in chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. He who is believing in me will never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and you do not believe. All that the Father gives to me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. For I have not come down from heaven to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. It's all about whose will do we do. Do we do the will of the Father, or do we do the will of the devil? And this gets into John, uh, 1 John chapter 3 that talks about, well, what, what fruit do you produce? Do you produce sin, or do you produce righteousness? If you still produce sin, you still produce aspects of fruit of the devil. You can't serve two masters. You can't be hot and cold. You cannot have be light with dark in, in you. Jesus defined what, what it means to be in light in Luke chapter 11. I think around like verse 33 or 32. You can't have any leaven. You can't have any dark part. That's, that's not light. So as you continue looking at this, Jesus makes some statements about eating his uh, body and you know, drinking his blood and, and people didn't understand. In verse 51, in John chapter 6, he says, I'm the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread, which, uh, and the bread also which I give for, for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews began to argue with one another, saying, How can this man give us his body to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourself. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my body is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. Now, they didn't understand what, what that meant to uh, you know, eat his body or drink his flesh. But he goes on to say what well, it means to abide in me. And later on, Jesus defined what it meant to abide. It means that you do the will of the Father, too. Just as Jesus walked and walked in obedience by the Spirit of God, so we also now receiving the same fullness of deity that Christ had, 
we're to walk in the same way. And, and we, we've covered those in, in episodes, you know, I know in Ephesians chapter 3, uh, the second half of chapter 3, it talks about being filled with all the fullness of God. Uh, we also talked about it in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13, the same fullness, uh, you know, receiving, achieving to the perfect man, the same fullness and measure of stature that belonged to Christ. Uh, it was also discussed in the book of Colossians when we did that episode. Again, just the fullness Christ had, we received the same fullness. So this isn't a new concept, and we discussed it earlier in, in uh, John chapter 1, of his fullness we have all received. But the disciples, some of his disciples didn't understand this. So unfortunately, uh, it says in verse 60, when many, therefore, even many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a difficult statement. Who can listen to this? But Jesus, conscious that his disciples grumbled at this, he said to them, does this cause you to stumble? Remember, these are disciples that had believed in Jesus. They were following him. But the problem is, the question is, do they have the Holy Spirit of God? You can believe, but if you don't have the Spirit of God, well, then there's a problem. Now, we know that uh, even the 12 apostles, they didn't have the Spirit of God until the end, until Pentecost. And we covered that in the episode, Don't Be Like the Disciples, before they had the Holy Spirit. And yet you'll have passages where it says they believe, but then later Jesus says, you have a hardened heart. You don't understand. Where is your faith? You have no faith. And they continued to struggle, just as Jesus had to rebuke Peter, because he had his mind set on things of the earth and not on things above. He says, get behind me, Satan. Why? Because your mind's not set on things above, but on the earth, things below. And we know when you get into Romans, it talks about where your mind is if it's of the spirit or of the flesh, whether or not you have life and whether or not you can even please God. And these are the things that God says. It's important to understand these things. And we covered those in the book in Romans chapter 8 in that episode. So continue to look at this as Jesus speaks in John chapter 6. In verse 63, he says, It's the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that did not believe, and who it would be that would betray him. Remember, uh, you know, the Spirit of God knows all things. It knows, even in God's predestined plan from the beginning of the foundation of the earth, who are those who are going to choose and endure to the end, who are those that aren't. So effectively, who truly have a belief that can save, versus who are those that will never have a belief that can save. Even though in the eyes of man, people think that they have a belief that can save. But God knows beyond that. So, as he continues in verse 66, actually verse 65, he was saying, For this reason I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him from the Father. As a result, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with Jesus anymore. But here you have his disciples. They believed. Well, in their eyes they believed, but in the eyes of God they didn't believe. They didn't have a belief that would eventually be perfected. Nope. They did not. Now, as we continue, we're going to look at another group of people that believed, the crowds. In John chapter 8, John chapter 8, we're going to go over to verse 31. And actually, before that, verse 30. It says, as he spoke these things, many came to believe in him. So you think, oh, is that a good thing? Well, you have repentance. You have being born again by the Spirit. You need all these things to result in salvation. It says these people came to believe in him. What kind of belief? Well, I always say, keep reading and we'll find out. Sometimes it tells us, sometimes it doesn't. So Jesus was saying in verse 31 to those Jews who had believed in him. So who is he speaking to? Is he just speaking to the random crowd or is he speaking to a specific group of people? Well, specific group of people. To the Jews who had believed in him. He says, if, notice the conditional if. If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. Well, now, why does he say that? Was that implying that they are disciples currently, they just need to continue? Or is he saying that, that well, you think you believe in me, but you really don't? I don't know. Let's keep reading. In verse 32, he says, And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Now, what does that mean, the truth will make you free? You see, a lot of this comes down to people who have a belief, and they don't even really truly understand what they believe in. Or they believe in only part of the truth, not the whole truth. Well, let's figure out what these people believed in. So the, they answered him. Remember, the Jews who had believed that Jesus is speaking to, in verse 33, they answered him. We are Abraham's descendants. We've never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? They didn't understand. 
that they believed. Well, many people have a belief, but they don't understand the truth. Jesus answered and said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who is committing sin is a slave of sin. The slave does not get to remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Oh, so now we have another concept. You see, anybody who has done a study of what it means to be crucified with Christ, what does it mean to be spiritually born again? What does it mean to receive a new heart, to be the good tree? You know that it's a sin that wages war with the soul. You know that it's a sin that dwells in the heart that defiles a man. You know that no one who's been born of God still has that same heart. They receive a new one. They receive a spirit of God which produces a different fruit. It's exclusive. It doesn't bear and allow both to be continued to be produced. And we'll see more of that when we actually look at the grace of God in the next episode. But here, just focusing on the belief, they didn't understand. You see, if you truly believe and you're continuing in the word, you don't continue to be a slave of sin. You don't struggle with it. It's not, it's not in you. You've been set free from sin. There's a difference between someone who's a slave of sin versus a slave of righteousness. A man who's been spiritually born again versus somebody who believes but has not been spiritually born again. One has a desire to serve God, to draw near, but cannot overcome the sin in their life. The other one overcomes and walks just as Christ walks, is an imitator of God, is holy just as God is holy in all their behavior, as perfect as the Heavenly Father is perfect, who lives their life with the same purpose of Christ, to live for righteousness, to commit no sin, have no deceit in their mouth, no, no longer do evil. They're able to love their neighbor as himself, which means to not sin against your neighbor as God defines in Romans chapter 13. These aren't my words. These are God's words. But there's many people, many different beliefs, and there's many struggling. That's why you have so much of the Bible is written to these people who are struggling, who don't have the truth, don't have the power. Or the people within the church that are falsely believing. It's a call to them because God loves his creation. He doesn't want or desire anyone to perish. But people must humble themselves and come in truth. So Jesus continues to speak to these people. We still don't know what type of a belief they have. Jesus says, I know you're Abraham's descendants in verse 37. But then what does he say about them? Yet you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. Now that's really interesting. These who believed in him, he says, well, if you continue in my word. Well, as it turned out, their belief wasn't a sincere belief. They didn't even understand really what the word, they didn't understand what it meant to be free. Jesus says his word has no place in them. Jesus goes on in verse 38 and says, I speak the things which I have seen with my father. Therefore, you do the things which you have heard from your father. Now Jesus is implying that they have a different father, but they believed. Well, unless the belief is results in being born again, being born of the new father, not of the earthly father, the devil, the spirit of the sons of disobedience, which we read about in Ephesians, all the sons of disobedience that were born into doing the will of the devil, well, until you escape that, you aren't of your earthly father. You have to be spiritually born again. That old man has to be put to death. So the Jews answered them. They didn't understand. They said, no, Abraham's our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. Gets back to deeds. Whose deeds do you do? Jesus then says, says but in verse 40, but as it is, you are seeking to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. This Abraham did not do. Again, these people don't understand. You see, until you have a new heart, you are a murderer. You can say you aren't, but you have the anger of men. You are a murderer. When you say that you aren't, you're basically lying to God. You're refusing to humble yourself and admit what, what God has to say about you. It's just as Jesus speaking to his people. These people don't understand. Jesus is speaking into what's actually in their heart. It doesn't matter if you have good intentions. God made all people with the ability to, to, to have agape love. We read that in Scripture. But they can't have a perfect love. That's the problem. Until you're born again. So Jesus gets more clear. He says, you're doing the deeds of your father. In verse 41, they said to him, we are not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Again, these people claim to believe in God. They claim to serve one God. They believe. Well, Jesus then tells them whose father is their father. In verse 43, it says, why do you not understand what I'm saying? It is because you cannot hear my word. Verse 44, you are of your father, the devil and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning. He does not stand in truth because there's no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own nature because he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. There you go. They didn't believe. 
Now, in their eyes, they did believe. But in the eyes of God, they did not. They did not have a true belief. They didn't have a new heart. They were not spiritually born again. Do you see the significance of this? It's really important to understand these things. But unfortunately, these things aren't being taught. They aren't being taught. All the contrasts. If you don't understand, you know, it's like anybody who ever take a complicated math class. I know I, I, I took math. I remember when I took my first, maybe it was pre-algebra or something, I struggled. I got like a D or a C in that class. I, it, re, it was really, really hard because I didn't understand all the rules of the math. I would apply some of them, but not get all of them. And I get the wrong answer and I would really struggle. And then I got a, a different teacher my next year who was able to teach more of all the principles that I didn't understand from the other teacher. And then math was easy. I got A's. I didn't get a new mind. I had the same mind. I just didn't understand the truth. I didn't understand the full truth of how to apply what was required to be applied. On the one hand, when you don't have all the rules, you fail. On the other hand, when you have all the rules, you're able to succeed if you are subject and obedient. But in this case, you have to un believe in truth to get the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God does an impossible work. It's the power of God that is beyond human comprehension. It does an impossible work. Now, in John chapter 12, we find out some more people about their belief. In chapter 12, uh, as we're looking at it, uh, let's see, in verse 30, in verse 36, uh, actually verse 35, Jesus said to them, For a little while longer the light is among you. Walk while you have the light, so that darkness will not overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. So while you have the light, believe in the light, so that you might become sons of light. Now, in verse 37, though he had performed so many signs before them, yet many were not believing in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, which he spoke, Lord, who has believed our report? Who has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason, they could not believe. For Isaiah said, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so that they would not see with their eyes. They would not understand with their heart and be converted. And I then healed them. That's right. That was God's will. Now you say, well, that doesn't make sense. Why, why is that? Well, we covered some of this in the episode of Romans chapter, I think it was 9 and chapter 11. If you want to go and listen to that episode, you'll understand why God did that. There was a purpose and a reason behind it. It wasn't that he didn't give them opportunity, just as these people didn't have opportunity. They had already rejected the truth. But even this, it says in verse 42 of John chapter 12, Nevertheless, many... Even of the rulers believed in him. Wait a second. How could they believe in him? It just says that they couldn't believe. Well, you see, that, that's, that's where you have to understand. Which belief are they talking about? A true belief that God would say is a true belief? Repentance, the Spirit of God, being born again, the new creation? Or is it just belief as in the belief of man? Uh, man's convictions, man's desires, man's understanding. Well, that belief is not a belief of God. You see, these people, it says many of the rulers even believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him for fear that would be, they would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. Well, we can go and we look at that. Uh, I think of Galatians chapter 1 where Paul says, If I'm seeking to please man, then I cannot be a bond slave of God. He cannot. Or Jesus talking about, well, who do you fear, man or God? Are you going to deny me before men? If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before the Father. So what type belief? Now, people are probably thinking, yeah, but didn't Peter deny him? You're right, he did. He didn't have the Spirit of God. He didn't have a belief that could save at that point. Again, go listen to the episode that we did, Don't Be Like the Disciples, before they had the Holy Spirit. They were two completely different people. One with a belief without being spiritually baptized. The other one with the same belief, but now being spiritually baptized, having power. The old man put to death. Let's look at somebody else who believed in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 12, actually 8, Acts chapter 8, Simon, in Acts chapter 8, verse 12, but when they had believed Philip, preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women alike. Even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued on with Philip. So in this case, you have Simon, he believed. And he was baptized. Now, later we find out, yeah, he was baptized, but not spiritually baptized. Remember, you have to be born of the will of God, born of the Spirit, not baptized of man and water. That's just an outward representation. Until you're spiritually baptized, your faith has not been perfected. 
you don't have a perfected faith. You're still an infant. And we covered that in Galatians. If you don't know what it means to be an infant in Christ, that's someone who believes but has not yet received the Holy Spirit of God. They are not yet a son of God. It's all discussed in Ephesians or Galatians chapter 4. You can go read about it. The one who's a slave of the world versus the one who's been set free and has received the Spirit of God. But as you read these things, you see these patterns. It becomes so clear and so obvious. These are fundamentals that should be taught in every church. This is what God teaches in His Word. This is the Word of God that every person should be hearing and not be deprived of the truth. So as you continue to read in chapter 8 of Acts, Simon believed and was baptized, but it was water baptism. In verse 14, Now when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the Word of God, they sent them Peter and John. And they came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Well, I thought they were spiritually baptized. No, no, they weren't. It's only water baptized. They're spiritually baptized. They would have had the Spirit of God. Verse 16, For he had not yet fallen on any of them, because they had simply been baptized in the name of Jesus. You have to be spiritually baptized. You can be water baptized in the name of Jesus. It doesn't do anything. Are you spiritually baptized? Most people don't understand the work of the Spirit. Most people don't understand the requirement to get a new heart. If you don't understand and believe in the full truth, then how do you even know what you're getting baptized for? Do you even know what the results of baptism is supposed to do? The Word of God has so much to say on all these details. But right now, I'm just focusing on the high level of belief to give you guys context for those who haven't heard these things so that you know that you need to go look at more, more into Scripture. So they began laying their hands on them, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on the hands of the apostles, he offered them money, saying, Give me this authority as well, so everyone who I lay my hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. Verse 20, Peter said to them, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have no part or portion in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Therefore, repent of this wickedness of yours, and pray that the Lord, if possible that the intentions of your heart might be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and are in the bondage or slavery of iniquity. He was still a slave of sin. He hadn't been set free. Only the Spirit of God can do that. That spiritual baptism is discussed heavily in Romans chapter 6. But he believed. He was at least water baptized. Guess what? That can't save a person. Let's look at another example. Uh, I want to go to Apollos, which is Acts chapter 18 and 19, but on the way I want to highlight a couple other places. Um, Let me see, in Acts chapter 13, uh, again, this concept of freedom, it's important. Freedom is such an important aspect of belief. It's all in the power of God and whether or not you have it. And in Acts chapter 13, verse 39, it says, It was talking about Jesus. In verse 38, it says, Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through him, through Jesus, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed. Through him. What does all that mean? Romans discusses it in detail. Galatians does too, as does Ephesians. Well, he says in verse 39, And through him, through Jesus, everyone who believes is freed from all the things which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. Now, this is discussed a lot more in detail in Galatians about can you become a righteous person through works of the law? Justified is to become righteous, to become righteous, to be righteous, to be declared righteous. It's someone who actually is righteous. Well, no one born into the world is righteous, but God can make you righteous to be a righteous person. Not just a title, but actually a state of being, a being of holiness in his sanctification that he places you in. Well, how does that happen? Well, God has to do a work. But you see, when he frees you from all the things that the law can add. The law only points out that you're a sinner. The law says, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do that. The more you try to please and seek God, the more you realize that you're a lawbreaker, a transgressor. Oh, gee, I wasn't supposed to steal. I did that. Oh, I wasn't supposed to curse. Oh, I cursed. Oh, I wasn't supposed to have the anger of man. It's the anger of man. The thought of anger in your heart It really is what Jesus defined as murder. Oh, I wasn't supposed to have the anger of man. Oh, shoot, I did that too. The law, the law can only convict you. It shows the sin in your life that you still have a bad heart. It can't change your heart. Only faith, a true faith, a true belief, being spiritually baptized. Only the Spirit can circumcise the old heart, remove it, and give you a new heart. 
Only a true belief and faith in Christ by which you receive that grace, that power of God, the fullness of God, can free you from the sin and the practice of sin because it dwells in you. It has to be removed from you. It has to be put to death and removed from your life. Turning over to Acts chapter 15. I want to talk about some of the, uh, the Jews here. In Acts chapter 15, verse 5. Now, what had happened is they were talking about uh, other people who had received the gospel and, and Gentiles were being converted. Well, there's a problem. In Acts chapter 15, verse 5, some of the sect of the Pharisees who had believed stood up saying, It is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the law of Moses. Well, but it's not about keeping the law. It's about being a doer of the law that we read about in Romans chapter 2. Somebody who has a new heart, the Gentiles, the word of God written in their heart. They have a new heart by the Spirit of God. They are now doers of the law. They don't break the law. When you have sin dwelling in your heart, you're a lawbreaker. You're now able to be a doer of the law. So that, that can't happen unless you have a new heart. But here it says these Jews who believed are trying to get them that they have to go be circumcised. Well, do these Jews who are believing and trying to push the law, requirements of the law as if it's an outward work and not an inward spiritual heart issue? Did they really have a belief that could save? I would tell you that their belief, no, they did not have a belief that could save. Why can I say that with confidence? Well, in Galatians, Galatians warns of this very issue. In chapter 5, uh, and, and we discuss all this in detail, so if you want the full context, go and listen to the episode we did on the book of Galatians. But in Galatians chapter 5, it says, it was for, 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 it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Behold, I, Paul, say to you, if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. I testify again to every man who receives circumcision, he is under obligation to keep the whole law. You have been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by the law, you have now fallen from grace. Goes on to say, You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? A little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. Says a persuasion did not come from God, but from these wicked men. You see, when you realize it's the Spirit of God that changes the heart, it's no longer trying to do outward rules or keeping ritual traditions. It has nothing to do with it. That was that was supposed to show you that you could never meet the requirements of God because you had a bad heart. Only the Spirit of God can cleanse you of all sin and give you a new heart. And that can only be received through faith. These people didn't understand. But yet here in Acts chapter 15, it says they believed. That's great. They severed themselves from Christ. They have a belief that it could not result in salvation. I pray that as you guys are listening to this, you're seeing uh, more of the full aspect of God's teaching. If you don't understand the full aspect of all the requirements and the teachings of God, then you're going to come to a false belief and not the belief that God clearly communicates and teaches in His Word. When, people, when we accurately handle it and look to him for the answers. Next, moving on to the Acts chapter 18 and 19. Now, in Acts chapter 18, uh, and, and we've covered this in some other episodes, but again, I'm kind of doing all, all, one big thing on belief here today. So it talked about Apollos. Um, in Acts chapter 18, verse 24, it tells us about this man named Apollos. It says, now, a Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian by birth, an eloquent man, came to Ephesus. So he's at the city of Ephesus, the church of Ephesians. He was mighty in the scriptures. Sounds like he was grounded in the word of God. You would say, well, that's a good thing. Verse 25, this man had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he was speaking and teaching accurately the things concerning Jesus. But then it says being only acquainted with the baptism of John. So when I look at this, it's like, well, yeah, he was probably fervent in his own spirit. It doesn't say the Spirit of God. He was only acquainted with the baptism of John. I can tell you he didn't have the Spirit of God. It says he was teaching accurately the things of Jesus. Okay, well, so the things he was teaching about Jesus were probably accurate. He believed Jesus was the Son of God. He probably believed Jesus died and rose again. Well, you can believe all those things. But if you don't understand the requirement that you have to believe and be born again and what that means and what it does, well, then what was your belief in you see, it's like, it's like the algebra. He knew half the math rules. He didn't know the rest. He gets the test, he's going to fail the question because he didn't know all the answers or all the, uh, the rules. So he's going to get a wrong answer. So what was the result of this? Well, he's making disciples. Now, as you keep reading in Acts chapter 18, in, in verse uh, 25, 
So he was, again, teaching accurately the things concerning Jesus, being acquainted only with the baptism of John. And he began, in verse 26, he began to speak out boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. But I thought he was speaking accurately. Well, the things he was teaching, he just wasn't teaching the whole truth. So then he left, he went over to Achaia, and over then he started doing work. And that's over on the, uh, the, the side where, you, where the um, cities of Corinth are. And if you notice, Apollos was at Corinth, remember? Some said, oh, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of, I'm of Christ. Has Christ been divided? Remember, that's 1 Corinthians, I think, chapter 1 or 2. We did an episode on that. But by that time, Apollos had, had the correct teaching. At this time, he didn't. So, in chapter 19, the very next chapter, in verse 1, it says, It happened while Apollos was at Corinth. Now Paul passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus. Remember, that's on the other side of the sea. And he found some disciples. Now remember, Apollos was there before him. But Apollos didn't understand spiritual baptism. So what happens when Paul meets these disciples that were most likely taught by Apollos? Well, verse 2, he says to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Oh, well, they had a belief. They said to him, Well, no, we've not even heard that whether there is a Holy Spirit. He said to them, And to what were you baptized? They said, Into John's baptism. They were baptized in water. John's baptism was water baptism. They were probably baptized in the name of Jesus, just like Simon was, but it was water baptized into the name of Jesus. You have to be spiritually baptized. But people aren't being taught these things. So Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling people to believe in him who was coming after him. It was Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When they laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. So it's just important to realize you can have different aspects where it will say, oh, well, they were baptized in Jesus. Well, they weren't baptized in Jesus. Well, they were baptized in water. They are baptized in spirit. They believed. They didn't believe. You have to understand what all these things mean. Is it a belief in the eyes of man? It was a belief in only part of the truth? Was it a belief, as God would say, a belief that results in salvation? Was it truly a spiritual baptism? Or was it simply a water baptism in the name of Jesus? As what happened to Simon and, and those others that were with him. I pray you're seeing this. Again, in Acts chapter 21, uh, there was another event where the Jews uh, were trying to push... Um, uh, circumcision. This is when Paul went back to Jerusalem uh, before he was he was taken captive and sent off to Rome for trial. And in Acts chapter twenty one, verse nineteen, after after Paul came, I'll see back up to verse eighteen. After they'd arrived in Jerusalem, in verse eighteen, the following day, Paul went in with us to James and the elders were present. And after he greeted them, he began to relate one by one the things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they began glorifying God. And they said to him, you see, brother, how many thousands uh, there are among the Jews who have believed and they are all, and they are all zealous for the law. So you have all these Jews that believed and they're zealous for the law. Well, what does that mean? So then he goes on in verse 21, and they say, And they have been told about you that you are teaching the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children, nor to walk according to the customs. What then will be done? They will certainly hear that, what you, uh, that you have come. Therefore, do this, and we will tell you, for we have four men who are under a vow. And they go him, and they have him go through, and um, purify, he, you know, he has him go through a rites of purification, so that they will, uh, you know, go through all the rites of purification and keep all the requirements of the law. So Paul goes through to do that, not as if he needs to do it, but more to try to appease these other people. But again, what we covered earlier in, in Galatians, all these Jews who believe, that's fine. You can have a belief, but when you're trying to add all these other ones as requirements, well, then you don't understand. I mean, there's nothing wrong with circumcising your children. M many people do. It's a common practice in America and, and other parts of the world. There's a lot of you know, medical benefits from that. So there's nothing wrong with doing it. But if you're, if you're going and saying, oh, well, you, this must be done. If I don't do this, then I cannot have favor with God. Well, then you know nothing of God. And that's what, these, that's what many of these Jews who believed were in. They'd already severed themselves from Christ. He's going to be in no benefit to them. 
They don't understand. It, it, it's it's kind of like in the Bible when it says, if one man thinks it's sin, then to him it is sin. Well, the opposite true is, is it, what you think, if you're doing that, then you're going to be judged according to that. And even if you think incorrectly and you say, oh, well, there's no God, well, you're still going to be judged because there is a God. That, that's true. You can't believe in something that's not true. But even if you believe in something that's false, you'll be judged for that false belief. You'll be accused, you'll be uh, charged as sin against you. Uh, they use that in the things, eating things, sacrifice to idols. He says, well, for me, it's not an idol. There's no such thing. I serve God. But to the one who's uh, convicted by it, if he eats, then him is sin. He'll be judged by it. And this is what God says. It's the same principle. Now, Romans, uh, Romans chapter 10. I have a couple more passages I want to look at. Actually, James, let's go to James. We're going to look at James chapter 2, first uh, quick passage in 1 Corinthians 15, then Jude, and then I think we'll be done. James chapter 2, uh, talking about a people who have a faith, but the problem is it's a faith that cannot save. They believe. He says, you know, even demons believe. And we did an episode on James chapter 2. It was a very powerful episode. It looks at the faith of Abraham that a lot of people uh, don't understand. But in James chapter 2, uh, it, it's talking about, do you, do you have, you know, works of faith? Do you, do you have true works of God? Is the result of the proof of the Spirit of God in you? Well, that, that all started in James chapter 1 when he said in verse 2, Consider it all joy, brethren, when you encounter various trials or temptations, knowing that the proof of your faith is producing endurance. And endurance must be having its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Well, that's a man who has a proof of faith. And we covered all that self about the one who's a doer and not a hearer who deceives themselves. Uh, about the man who doesn't have the anger of man. If you have the anger of man, then you can never achieve the righteousness of God. And then he's commanded that you still need in humility to receive the word implanted, which is able to save your soul because you haven't. James chapter 1, the whole book of James has so much truth in it. We, we cover all those chapters and episodes. You can listen to them separately. But in chapter 2, verse 14, it says, What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but has no works? Can that faith save him? The answer is no. It says in verse 17, even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. Verse 18, someone may well, well say, you have faith, I have works. Show me your faith without works. I'll show you my faith by my works. Verse 19, you believe that God is one. Oh, you do well. You know, the demons also believe, and they shudder. But the demons aren't going to have fellowship with God, <clears throat> even though they believe God is real. There's a lot more to belief. He then says in verse uh, 20, are you willing to recognize this, you foolish or stupid fellow, that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? You see, faith was working with his works. As a result of works, the faith was perfected. And scripture was then fulfilled, which was the prophecy that was stated, Abraham believed God and was credited to him as righteousness. That was a statement of prophecy. It was stated before Abraham had a perfected faith. A lot of people don't know that, and they don't know all the story, but we, we go into detail. So again, at the end, it says, just, uh, it says, in the same way, verse 25, was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she received messengers and sent them out another way? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. And this is the truth. This is the truth. It's the same thing. You can have a faith that is dead. You can have a belief that is dead. You cannot do spiritual fruit or spiritual works or live in the ways of God without being spiritually born again. Moving over to Romans chapter 10, uh, again, talking about a belief, a belief that saves. A lot of people know Romans 10, 9. They don't know the background of chapter 10, and they don't know what it means in verse 11 or verse 10. They know 10, 9, with the heart a person believes, um, or that in verse 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Well, there's a lot of context to that. What's the context? Well, first, I'd say read the entire book up to that point. Most people don't understand. But we'll just start with a chapter. In chapter 10, verse 1, it says, Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer for them is their salvation. That's the desire. For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God. They have a zeal for God. They have a passion for God, a desire for God. But it's not in accordance with knowledge. You see, it all gets back to, is it in truth? Is it in truth? And verse 3, for not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. You see, they were trying to do works of the law. Works of the law cannot change your heart. 
but by grace, receiving all the fullness of the deity of God, the same fullness that Christ had. So you can now live by the Spirit, produce fruits of the Spirit, which only produces good fruit, cannot produce bad fruit. Well, then now you have the righteousness of God in you. But you have to be, believe and be spiritually born again, spiritually baptized. For the Christ is the end of the law of righteousness to everyone who believes. There is no more. Christ is the end. Once you receive the Spirit of God through faith, the grace of God, the Spirit of God, all the fullness, then you now are a slave of righteousness. Your members are a slave of righteousness. You walk and dwell in holiness. You don't continue to commit sin. as what Peter defines as what the true grace of God is. And we'll cover that in the next episode on grace. True grace. But you see, Moses writes about the law. Well, the law is only something you can outwardly practice. The man who practices the righteousness which is based on the law has to live by that. The problem is you can't because it can't change the heart. But in verse 6, the righteousness based upon faith, well, that's an inward change, not an outward change. The inward change results in an outward change, but it's an inward change by faith. You see, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is, who to bring Christ down. Or verse 7, who will descend in the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart. This is the word of faith we are preaching And see, people don't understand. What does that mean? It's in you. It's in your heart. Oh, I believe I have Jesus in my heart. No, no, you don't understand what that means. You have to understand what God defines what that means. Now, that was defined very clearly in Romans chapter 6. What does it mean to be spiritually baptized with Christ? What does it mean to no longer be under the law, but under grace? Most people, they've heard that statement. Oh, I'm no longer under the law. I'm under grace. Tell me what that means. Not in your words. Tell me what God says what that means. Listen to the episode. On Romans chapter 6, we'll be reviewing some of those again in the, in the episode I do next on grace. And in verse 9, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised from the dead, you'll be saved. In verse 10, for with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness. Well, what does that mean? I ask people, what does that mean? A heart a person believes resulting in righteousness. And people tell me, oh, it means this, it means this, it means this. I'm like, okay, that's great. What does God say it means? He already defined what that means. He already taught what happens, what the Spirit does, what the grace of God does in Romans chapter 6. Can you tell me how God says what happens and contrasts? And they can't. I'm like, well then, how do you have confidence in that verse? You don't know what it means. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Another group of people who believed in vain. Don't be like these people. A belief that cannot save. And 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Um... The Word of God says, Now, I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which you also received, in which you also stand, by which you are being saved, it's a present tense, if, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. So here, there's, uh, again, a endurance, a perseverance. You have to continue. You have to hold fast. You can't stop. And, and, and that's another episode we'll do on the endurance and the perseverance. It's a requirement. So if not, then you believed in vain. But that's somebody who already is standing in the truth, who is being saved if they hold fast. But then as you keep reading in chapter 15, he talks about another group of people that has nothing to do with endurance. Their belief up front is already in vain. They are not standing in any truth. As you keep looking at chapter 15, In verse 12, it says, Now if Christ has preached that he is raised from the dead, how do some among you, some among the the, the Corinthian church, were saying that there is no resurrection from the dead? No resurrection from the dead? Verse 13, But if there's no resurrection from the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. Verse 14, If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. It's empty. Your faith is also vain, empty. Moreover, we've been found false witnesses of God. We testify against God that he raised Christ from the dead. If, in fact, he did not raise him from the dead, if the dead are not raised, Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then all who have fallen and have died in Christ have perished. Well, some of the the quote-unquote church members, Christians in the church of Corinth, claim there is no resurrection of the dead. Guess what? They had a belief of faith that was vain, empty. It could not save them. That's why I say you you have to understand the full context. But people don't even know all these stories. They just use belief, belief, belief so flippantly, and they don't even understand what it means. Again, speaking to some of these people who are deceived, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, it says, Stop being deceived, imperative, 
negative imperative command, stop being deceived, bad company corrupts good morals, awake to righteousness, and stop sinning. Some of you have no knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. And the last passage, Jude. Jude, chapter 1. It's only one chapter in Jude. Now in Jude, he says in verse 2, May uh, may mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. In verse 3, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you, every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt it necessary to write to you appealing to you that you contend earnestly for the faith. He has to write that that they must contend earnestly for the faith? Well, what's the problem? Well, he says in verse 4, certain people have crept in unnoticed. Does it say that they were noticed? No, unnoticed. They're in the church and you don't even notice them. Now, long beforehand, they've already been marked out for this condemnation. God knows them, but you don't. You see, God sees them as ungodly people who turn the grace of God into licentiousness, and they deny our Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Well, how do you deny Him? Well, Titus chapter 1, the last verse of chapter 1 says, Many people confess to know God, but by their deeds they deny Him, being detestable and disobedient and disqualified for any good work. He says earlier that they don't have a good heart. They still have a bad heart. They're defiled inside. But they confess to believe in God. They confess. He says they deny Him. By their life, by their deeds, they deny him. They still produce wickedness. He says in verse 5, I remind you, I desire to remind you that though you you know these things once and for all, that the Lord, after saving a people, he saved a people out of the land of Egypt. That's right, he saved them, his chosen people, redeemed them with the blood of the lamb, without cost. He subsequently destroyed all those who did not believe. Like, wait a second. He saved them, then he destroyed them? It says they did not believe. I thought they believed. Well, it depends. In the eyes of man, they had a belief. They believed in God. But in the eyes of God, they did not have a belief that saves. They never got a new heart. We read all about that in Deuteronomy. And we did an episode on that. But just to show you in Exodus, I think it's chapter 12. And I'll just quote this and then we'll close in prayer. So in Exodus chapter 12... This is after they came out of the Red Sea. They parted the Red Sea. They came out of the Red Sea. And after they came out of the Red Sea, it says in Exodus chapter 14, actually, um, verse 29, the sons of Israel walked on dry land through the midst of the sea, and the waters were like a wall to him on the right and the left. Thus Yahweh saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. When Israel saw the great power which Yahweh has used against the Egyptian, the people feared Yahweh and believed in Yahweh and believed in his servant Moses. So they believed. If they believed, then what happened? They believed. What happened? Well, they didn't have a belief and they didn't have a new heart. They didn't have a belief that could save. And so God destroyed them. Actually, destroys, I think, all but like Caleb and Joshua. Through many different trials, they kept failing in the temptations. And eventually, God says, okay, I'm destroying all of you. And there are many different things along the way. And we covered this in um, the episodes. How did, I think, uh, um, what was it? One of the episodes is your faith based upon truth or lies. I think we covered mo- much of it in there. We looked at a lot of the, the life of Israel, the truth, truth and lies of your faith. And so he destroyed them. But they believe, but God says they didn't believe. Well, what happened? Um, I guess I'll leave you with this passage in Hebrews, which actually explains it. I'll give you God's answer. So what God says in Hebrews chapter 4, and actually chapter 3, he says in chapter 3, verse 12 of Hebrews, Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. Take, be, but encourage one another day after day as long as it's still called today so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. That's right, sin hardens the heart. You see, in verse 17 it says, who, did, who was God angry with for 40 years? And who was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? You see, even though they believed in God, they still had a bad heart. They didn't have a new heart, they had a hard heart. So they continued in sin even though they believed in God. And so they could not please God. And so in verse 18, it says, And who who did he swear that they would not enter into his rest? But those who were disobedient. So you see, they were not able to enter because of unbelief. You see, to disobey is to not believe. We covered that in 
John chapter 3, verse 36. To those who believed in the name, uh, uh, and right, remember, John chapter 3, verse 36. Let me just read that, that one again to you. Luke, John. So John 3, 36. He who is believing in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. And to continue, it, it warns us in chapter 4, verse 1, Therefore, let us fear, if a promise remains of entering rest, that any of you may seem to come short of it. For indeed, we've had the same good news preached to us as they did. But the word they heard did not profit them. It was not united by faith with those who heard. He goes on to say in verse 6, Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly had the good news preached to them, failed to enter because of disobedience. So in verse 11, therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest so that no one will fall through following the same example of disobedience, even though you believe. If it's not a belief with a being born again, or it's not a belief that endures, that remains faithful to God, well, then you don't enter. Father, I thank you for your word of God. I thank you that you're a loving, merciful God that desires all men to be saved and that none to perish. But Father, we know it must be in truth. And it must be where the grace of God has its full way in our life and that the power of God transforms us and gives us a new heart, a new heart to serve you in holiness. Oh God, I pray that your people will turn to your word. They will dig deep into your word, oh God, and open their eyes and their ears and let them understand and be set free. Let them be set free as Jesus defined it, to be set free by the power of God. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We hope this weekly program helped rekindle your zeal to know, love, and serve Christ day by day. If you enjoyed the program, consider subscribing and sharing with your friends. Thanks for listening.